So I was born in Zimbabwe, and in 2008, I watched as the central bank printed these. $100 trillion. When I showed this note to a friend here, he said, wow, that's more stars than there are in our galaxy. Three eggs cost $100 billion <laughs> just before the currency collapsed and became worthless, and the wealth of millions of people was wiped out. My grandfather stopped drawing his pension because the costs to do so were more than the value of it. Hyperinflation is inevitable when currency and money can be created without restraint. The irony is now that this note has value again, but not because it is useful as a currency, but as a memento of how money destroys nations. In South Africa, my parents eventually moved there, as well as many other Zimbabweans. During apartheid, the South African government forcibly moved a lot of black people, all the black people, out of the cities and into territories called homelands. Informal settlements sprung up that were poor and lacked services outside of the towns. And the legacy of this remains today. My father was committed to serving these poor communities, and so he moved us to a small town, the name of which means place of stones, and he became a school teacher. I attended a dusty little school, and together with my siblings, we formed the majority of the white kids. I learned to speak Tswana, and I grew a strong bond with that school, as well as many schools like it that remains with me today. Just outside of the school was a landfill where all the rubbish was dumped, and many people lived on the rubbish dump, scrounging for food and looking for useful items with which to build their lives. My father would make giant pots of soup and load them into the back of our van that he had had the, the seats removed and uh, would transport it to the landfill. There was a lot of sloshing about, and so he made my brother and I sit on the lids. And in spite of our best efforts, a bit was always lost. He would serve the soup in tin cans that he found lying around on the, on the dump, and my brother and I would wander around looking for interesting pieces of junk to play with, with the kids that we met there. My father went out of his way to do good for the people in those communities. But for us, it's impractical, impractical to do what he did. Aid organizations act as trusted intermediaries between us and the causes we believe in. But there's a leaky bucket problem. Money that is donated leaks out in the form of administration costs, inefficiencies, and sometimes corruption. Clearly, the financial systems that we depend on today leave something to be desired. And in 2000, in the early 2000s, with the advent of the internet, Milton Friedman, a Nobel Prize winning economist, predicted that what was missing but would soon be invented was a reliable e-cash. He didn't mean a currency that was controlled by the banks, but a digital form of sound money that acted like cash. Sound money has or is linked to something with intrinsic value like gold. And cash is something you can keep on your person without having to trust a custodian. In, in 2009, uh, prompt, uh, prompted by the, the global financial crisis, a group of researchers and developers fulfilled Milton Friedman's prediction, and they created a technology called Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a decentralized currency. That means it's not issued by a central bank and not governed by any authority. It was designed to be a digital form of gold, which means it acts as a hedge against inflation. It is also a peer-to-peer -peer payment network, and anybody with access to the internet can use it. When I first heard about Bitcoin, it was during the height of the financial crisis, and the Zimbabwean dollar had already collapsed. There was no more fertile ground for the idea of a decentralized, peer-to-peer -peer digital form of sound money to take root than in southern Africa. And I wondered if this technology could solve the leaky bucket problem and allow people to directly support the causes they believe in. So memories of my childhood led me down the path 
to a small school called Moene Primary. Moene is located on the outskirts of the city of Johannesburg in South Africa. It is a legacy of apartheid and very close to where Nelson Mandela lived as a boy. Like many schools in South Africa, it is given a small budget that is never enough to cover the costs of running the school. So broken toilets remain unfixed, and heating and cooling is uh, left off to pay for more important items. Mostly, what happens is that utilities are left unpaid, and massive debts accrue. And this is where I saw an opportunity. I was working in the energy industry at the time, and I was building smart metering technology. And I had the idea to link a Bitcoin address to a smart meter. This meant that anybody around the world could directly fund that meter. So I had it installed at Emmaweni Primary School, and I wondered. What to do next? A friend of mine in Vienna, Ed Hess, heard about this experiment. He was giving a talk in Boston, and he suggested that we do a live demo from the conference. So I drove down at three o'clock in the morning to Emoeni, and I videoed into the conference, and I explained to the delegates what I had created, and I said that they can now directly fund the energy needs of this school. So I walked around the school. It was pitch dark. The meter had no credits on it, and I showed the meter and explained to the delegates what it would do. It was completely dark, and、uh, wanted to give them a feeling of what it was like to be down there. I was on the other side of the world compared to them. So Ed Hess scanned the Bitcoin address into his phone at the conference, and he sent a Bitcoin. Which was worth about $500 at that time, about five and a half thousand kilowatt hours of energy, enough to fund the energy needs of that school for an entire month. So he sent the payment, and for an anxious few seconds, I sat and waited. And eventually, the Bitcoin hit the meter, and the lights went on. He didn't know this. None of the delegates knew this. But behind me, the teachers had been so excited, and the parents were so excited that they didn't want to miss this, and they'd been sitting behind me the whole time. And they started celebrating, and so did the delegates all the way at MIT in Boston. And they shared, all of them shared a unique experience without needing a bank, or a remittance company, or an aid organization. Osizo means help in Zulu, and I've created the first of its kind crowdfunding platform, where people from around the world can directly fund the energy needs. Of needy African schools and hospitals, you can touch their lives right now through this address. Another interesting aspect about cryptocurrencies is that it allows us to reach the long tail of charitable causes. Now, the long tail was popularized by Chris Anderson, and if we apply it to charities, it shows us how there are usually a small number of causes and charities that get the most funding. But there are many causes out there, down the long tail, that we cannot reach. With cryptocurrencies, we can now reach that long tail. So all of human history has been punctuated by periods of intense creativity and innovation, innovation that has shaped civilization and defined our culture. But it is almost universal, whenever we are faced with something new, to treat it with fear, skepticism, and doubt. And cryptocurrencies are no different. The internet gave us all a voice that can be heard around the world, but cryptocurrencies allow us to be more than just heard, but to also be felt. So, reach out and touch someone. Thank you. <laughs>